First of all, let me begin by saying it's so wonderful to see you all, um, some masked, some unmasked, um, but it's wonderful to see so many um, faces uh, in the crowd who have had some association over the years with um, CDDRL. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Catherine Stoner, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the current Mossbacher Director at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. And I'm also a senior fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute, which houses the center, of course. So I wanna begin, first of all, by welcoming all of you to what for us is a special event, CDDRL's 20th anniversary. And especially, yeah, we made it. <laughs> um, and extend a sincere thanks to those of you who traveled um, either from across campus, which for some is difficult, I know, um, especially business schoolers, uh, it's hard for them to come across the street and see daylight. So it's good to see you here. Um, and also uh, those of you who came from as far away as we have from Israel, we have from Toronto uh, and random places uh, on uh, the East Coast of the United States, which I hear can be very important. Um, so thank you again for coming uh, to CDDRL or coming back to CDDRL. We also have a few alumni from our Summer Fellows Program uh, joining us, uh, our, some honors students uh, from the past and um, the present who are here. Um, and we're so glad that you could all come and join us and for the workshop tomorrow. I wanna thank our supporters and donors too for their ongoing support of the work we've done at the center over the last 20 years. And I'm especially pleased to welcome and they just came in, so great timing. <laughs> and we did not practice this ahead of time. Um, Bruce, Nancy, uh, and Jack Mossbacher, uh, Angela Nomalini, who I know is in flight, Stephanie Evans, um, Mula Hisham Alawi, and Zako Fisher, who are all with us um, today. Your support over the last 20 years has been absolutely transformational um, and integral to what the center has become. And uh, we'll have the opportunity to continue building together here, uh, hopefully in the future. I think the work that we've uh, done together is especially um, important um, to celebrate and also um, to double down on at a time when democracy, responsible and effective governance are at risk here in the United States and it's appropriate and not by chance that we're having this uh, anniversary conference um, just as the US midterm elections are taking place next week. Um, when democracy responsible and effective governance are under assault in places even here in the United States and of course under armed assault uh, in Ukraine. So I'll just say a few words um, about CDDRL before we get to the main event um, and um, uh, just take us back to 2002, and I apologize um, to some of you who are staying through the evening. We're going to have some 2002 trivia, so sharpen those uh, memory skills now. Um, and then I will step aside and introduce our moderator um, for this afternoon's panel, Didi Kuo. So I did a little bit of research, because that's what I do, um, to uh, find out more about the beginning of the center and how we got to 2022 so quickly, it seems. The kernel of the idea for uh, a center began as a small faculty seminar in the autumn of 2000. And many members of that seminar had just returned either from uh, working in government as uh, Chip Blacker did, or were deep into research in uh, different parts of the world. Um, and they were taken with really the question of how we could deepen um, the gains that had been made in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War and how we could um, enhance development and democracy, um, promoting good politics and economic prosperity globally, and so how we could do this worldwide. So some of the original questions the group was concerned with were asking what it takes basically to move a country forward developmentally. The group was quintessentially Stanford interdisciplinary and congenial, drawn from Stanford Law School, including Tom Heller, Eric Jensen, who's still with us here in the front row even, um, and former president of Stanford from 1992 until 2000, Gerhard Casper, who's also here with us 
today in the front row. The lawyers are very keen, clearly. They all sit up front. From the Graduate School of Business, uh, we also had our late colleague, John McMillan, and our once and now again uh, colleague, Peter Henry, John Meyer from the Department of Sociology in the Ed School, and Abner Greif, an economist uh, from the Economics Department, and then some of the motley crew of political scientists you see sitting on the stage. Um, and one will be looming in the background, Larry Diamond, uh, on Zoom shortly. Steve Krasner was also part of the original group and unfortunately he couldn't join us today. But by the spring of 2001, this seminar series had gone well enough that this group made the bold choice to institutionalize it. And with the support of uh, former Dean of the Law School, Paul Brest, who at the time um, was the president of the Hewlett Foundation, um, and the additional support of the still relatively new, fresh, young president of Stanford, John Hennessy, um, uh, who's also here today. I actually even have that in my notes, Mike, so you're jumping way ahead. I, I'm aware that he's here, and we thank John very much for his early support and belief in us, because we did come to him with a lot of wacky ideas uh, over the years, and, and he, I was always shocked, having come from Princeton, how kind he was to even uh, actually take, take the call um, and the meeting. Um, and so by the autumn of 2002, the center opened its doors. And actually, I should say door, uh, since it was really just the director uh, at the time, who was Chip Blacker, um, and an administrative assistant with a few scattered faculty offices around the university um, and um, um, a few uh, stray postdocs, some of which are here today, actually, in that beginning period. But Steve Krasner uh, returned from his first tour of government service under George W. Bush. Remember him? He seems so benign now, doesn't he? <laughs> um, and the addition of a few more pre and post docs um, who are all now grown up professors, CDDRL was up and running. Uh, and it was almost exactly 20 years ago. So from that modest beginning and a very modest budget, Chip, you'll remember that, um, the center was, has grown to be one of the largest here at FSI with about 40 affiliated faculty and researchers, a host of training programs like the um, Summer Fellows Program, generously supported for about a dozen years by Ingrid Hills and Bill and Phyllis Draper, and now with an alumni network of almost 500 fellows, and I have to pause and say, two of whom shared a part of the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize for the work they did for the Russian Human Rights Organization Memorial. Frank's wildly successful Fukuyama's uh, Leadership Academy for Development that has almost 2,000 alumni globally now, and our Fisher Family Honors Program, um, sponsored by uh, Sako Fisher and her family, and Sako's here with us today as well, with about 200 undergraduate alumni, a few of whom I see here too, and uh, our newest training program, Strengthening Ukrainian Democracy and Development, which is building on the success of our earlier Ukrainian Emerging Leaders program. And I'll pause here to point out that one of our former fellows there, Alexandra Matvichuk, and her Center for Civil Liberties shared with our other former fellows um, the 2022 Nobel Prize, um, this time for her work in Ukraine. <laughs> our current and original founding faculty uh, are not only some of the brightest intellectual lights in the field of development and democracy and the rule of law. Um, at Stanford, I would argue that they are the best globally, and we're very, very fortunate to host their cutting edge research uh, over the last 20 years. We have actually completed, I looked on our website today, over 60 projects, um, produced hundreds uh, of articles and books um, that have been incredibly impactful uh, globally. So we don't have to say we're trying to make the world a better place like some people at the business school sometimes say. Uh, I should mention my husband actually is employed there. Um, we are making the world uh, a better place. Um, I want to especially point out the amazing work of the Poverty, Violence and Governance Lab led by our colleague uh, Beatrice Magaloni, whose work was awarded just last month the Stockholm Prize in Criminology. Our new, there she is over there, actually, for the a clap. Our new deliberative democracy lab, which is led by our colleague Jim Fishkin, also here this evening. 
and the recognition uh, of our FSI leader and former CDDR director, Michael McFall, who this summer was awarded the Order of Merit Third Degree by the President of Ukraine for his work in support of Ukraine. So I should say that I could actually spend most of the rest of the afternoon talking about uh, all of the great things my colleagues have done. I just mentioned a few things that have happened in the last four months. Um, but I need to stop at this, at this point. Um, and again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And a special thank you to our wonderful CDDRL staff who are scattered around the room for your amazing work in putting this event together and for tolerating my occasional micromanagement of what you were doing. Um, I want to leave you with this thought, and that is that CDDRL is unique. It marries theories of international political and economic development with practice while embedded in one of the best, if not the best, university in the world. The work we have been doing and have done and will continue to do is hard. Um, we have seen democratic and developmental gains and losses over these last two decades, and we continue to learn from both and to meet these new challenges with um, an ongoing effort to actually, as I said, make the world and its inhabitants um, live better. So it's been a privilege to share some of this journey with uh, my wonderful colleagues here uh, and with many of you. And I'll now turn the microphone over to uh, Didi Kuo, who is a senior research scholar here at CDDRL and our associate director for research um, to introduce our panel and to begin our discussion. Didi is a scholar of US politics in comparative perspective. Imagine comparing the US to anything. <laughs> Didi does it. Um, and she also co-directs our Fisher, Family's honor, uh, uh, Fisher Family Undergraduate Honors Program and is a true treasure to the CDDRL community. So over to you, Didi. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you all of you for being here. So I have the distinct honor of introducing our illustrious panel today, beginning in chronological order of directors with Chip Blacker, who is the Olivier Nomolini Professor in International Studies and Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, hereafter FSI, or it would take forever. He was director of FSI from 2003 to 2012 and director of CDDRL from 2002 to three. Michael McFall, who is director of FSI today, Ken Olivier and Angela Nomolini, Professor of International Studies in the Department of Political Science, the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Director of CDDRL from 2005 to 2009. Larry Diamond. It was Diamond, just that short? Apparently. I felt like I was there forever. And then you oh went to God. government, January 2009. So Larry Diamond, I'm not sure if we can show. There oh, is. there he is. Yay! Hi, Larry. Yay! And hopefully we'll be joined by Rosie Diamond as well. Um, Larry is no, a Moss Factor, no. senior fellow. No. His Labrador. She squirreled away. Senior fellow in global democracy at FSI. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and was director of CDDRL from 2009 to 2015. Frank Fukuyama the Olivier Nomolini Senior Fellow at FSI, Director of the Masters in International Policy Program and Director of CDDRL from 2015 to 2021. And finally, but not last, Catherine Stoner, the Moss Factor Director of the CDDRL, Senior Fellow at FSI, Professor of Political Science and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, both by courtesy, and Director of CDDRL from 2021 to present and was formerly Deputy Director here. So, I think I'm mic'd still, great. <laughs> We're going to just start with a few questions that I'll pose to our panelists before we open it up to all of you for questions. Um, Catherine started by going back in time to 2002, so I'm going to leave us there 20 years ago when CDDRL was initially founded. Can you each take a minute to talk about how the world looks different today than it did 20 years ago? From each of your perspectives, how do you assess the general state of democracy development and rule of law and we'll begin with you, Chip. Thank you, Didi. Um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, take a moment in the spirit of the day um, <clears throat> to say a few words uh, in advance of that as the founding director. Um, I did not know that John Hennessy was gonna be here. Uh, I'm delighted that John is here. John was instrumental in the creation of the center uh, at multiple points, uh, 
and the nascent period of anything is very hard to bring along to maturity. Um, and John was present at the foundation, uh, moved heaven and earth to help us do what we ended up doing. And <clears throat> during uh, the Stanford challenge, uh, John was on the road a lot, and every now and then um, he asked me to accompany him to talk about what was going on at Stanford. And every time he talked about moving the institution forward, one of the uh, agents for that was CVBRL. So thank you, John, for your support. It meant the world to, to me and to all of us. <clears throat> so I do want to say a couple of words about um, <clears throat> how it felt um, to start this beast. Um, and it felt really good because it was a pretty optimistic time. Uh, the setup uh, for the panel today actually used the word optimistic or optimism. And I think that is the correct way to characterize the way most of us felt. Now, there's a difference between optimism and false hope. So I think we spent a lot of time trying to figure out um, whether this the moment of optimism was just that, a moment, or in fact, something likely to endure and what it meant and how to increase the likelihood that what we were seeing would continue over time. So we went into it with our eyes open, I would uh, uh, argue, and I'll just speak personally, and also profoundly confused, <clears throat> because I did not understand the relationship between um, democratic political development, by which I really mean uh, a more inclusive and participatory and accountable form of governance, economic development, and the issue of governance and the rule of law. And it was partly out of my own frustration coming out of the government, uh, where um, I had the pleasure of, of uh, leading the charge in uh, President, President Clinton's first term. Uh, from the National Security Council on matters having to do with Russia, and U Ukraine, and Eurasia. That was the name of the directorate at the time. It's an irony in that. Um, and I came out of that <clears throat> profoundly confused because I wasn't sure which came first. It was a chicken and egg problem. Do you need good politics or do you need good economics or do you need good governance? And what is the relationship between and among those three pieces? And we in the faculty seminar that um, Catherine referred to. We spent a lot of time trying to sort our way through that. Eric was part of that. Gerhardt was part of that. Larry, I mean, everyone really. Frank came a little later. Frank missed that chapter. Um, but they were very intense, very interesting, very important conversations. And at the end of them, we decided there's something here that's really important. We all don't understand it as well as we should. We should create an institutional mechanism that allows us to continue doing this and maybe actually uh, have an impact. Uh, and from the outset, we thought of about two things. One was the scholarly impact or the academic impact, coupled with the possible policy implications. Um, and the second piece of it was teaching and training. From, from, from the very outset, I was talking to Mike about this the other day, you can find a relatively early draft of the proposal, which we ended up submitting to the Hewlett Foundation um, that talked about a summer fellows program. And the model, Mike and I talked about this, the model we had in mind was the business school model, but in reverse, right? Um, uh, the, the, the summer fellows program for the business school, uh, they pay in order to take advantage of the treasure that is Stanford. We did it the other way. We went out finding people, paid them in essence, paid for their costs to get them here, right? So I said, it's the same concept, it's just the flow of money is <laughs> the reverse. Uh, and to the credit of the Hewlett Foundation and our various very generous funders, uh, we were able to start that program, which as you've heard, has gone on to do really extraordinary work. But from the outset, the idea was, we need to know more about this, we need to generate more knowledge, we need to get that out there, and we need, we need to keep the interdisciplinary part of the conversation going. That was the key piece. And it's better to do that if you have some institutional scaffolding around you than not. 
And two, that's also a way to move forward on the teaching and training program. So, so that was the inspiration. Um, uh, and I'll leave the second part of my comments uh, about how that compares to where we find ourselves now. Um, the short answer of how I feel now about this is I'm really glad we made the investment that we did 20 years ago, because I think we have a much better understanding of where we've been and what needs to happen to move those um, uh, important issues forward in a period that's much less welcoming. So in the interest of time, I'll stop there, Catherine. Mike. So Didi, we're talking about the big questions now, and then we're going to talk about the institution in your second. I'm just yes. trying to remember the sequence yep. of questions, because right. all I really want to do is talk about CDDRL and all the great people, because that's what it's, I really want came here to do. But I'm going to save that, because you told me to talk about <laughs> bigger things first. And I, so I didn't have as much time as I wanted to to go back and look at, I didn't do as much research. Catherine, it's good to always go do research. but. I do remember I was here for four years and uh, running the place before I joined the government. That's how, why I left. Um, and I, I don't feel like I really ever left and I'm still, I still feel like I'm part of CDDRL. That's why it's such a special place. That's question two. But on the, on the research agenda, I, I would say five or six things. I'm gonna say them very quickly. Uh, one, just to, to remember, it was a more optimistic time, right? Mm -hmm. I took over right after the Orange Revolution. We wrote a book about the Orange Revolution and democratic breakthroughs, yeah. explaining democratic breakthroughs. That was a big research agenda that lots of us worked on now. Now we're talking about a lot about autocratic break, uh, democratic <laughs> breakdown, <laughs> autocracies, right? That's a very different research agenda than we had 20 years ago. Second, we had several projects. Catherine and I did one of them together. Amikai is here, but I haven't seen him. Oh, there he is. Uh, Amikai and I did another one. Um, on international dimensions of democratization. Uh, we did a book comparing European and American uh, approaches. We did a book on all over the world. And, and by the way, we had variation on the dependent variable. So we looked at some places that broke through and some places that didn't and tried to get at, at whether the international had anything to do with that. I think it's important to remember that was in the, in the wake of the, the, the war in Iraq and many of us, and Frank, even before he got here, uh, in a much more profound way than myself, although Larry wrote a book about it too, now that I think about it. But Larry writes a book about everything. You got to remember that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, uh, squandered victory, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that your book from this period? Um, uh, uh, and I think there were those of us in a empirical way, and by the way, this is always, we're balancing research and policy, and I think it's one of the unique things we do in addition to being interdisciplinary, but we're, we're, I think we're disciplined about it. Uh, maybe not always, but I think we, we are and should be. But we wanted to explain international dimensions. I think there was a policy piece that we wanted to say, not everything is lost because of this, this war in Iraq for those that were in the business, uh, you know, in terms of policy. And I know some of Alex Thiers here somewhere. I know there, there are you know, practitioners that were doing this. I'm struck by how little work is being done on that topic academically. And maybe I want to put in parentheses, I left for the government for five years, and then I've been running FSI for another several years. Uh, and maybe I don't know about the literature. I want to just and, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot going on on that subject. That's depressing to me. And, and uh, that's where we're at. Third, variation. Um, you know, you, I think one very innovative thing we used to do in our seminars, at our class, Catherine and I used to teach the class together, um, was, was explaining variation. You know, why do some places become democratic and some places become autocratic? Um, we're still doing that, uh, but I think we should do more of it. I think, I think we're, we're, there's too much, you know, we're, 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 there's a lot of work on autocracies these days because there's a lot of new autocracies or a lot of a lot of resilience, and I just want to keep open the possibility that these are not as static things. Um, and we need to explain why some countries become democratic, like you said, why they fall apart. Uh, but, but what are the big things that, that lead to those outcomes? Um, uh, too much studies of things in equilibrium right now, not enough about uh, the, the things in change, although that just reflects our times. Uh, fourth, models of development. Uh, and this is just me, because uh, I'm sitting next to Frank, and, and I, I wonder how he thinks about these things. But 
But I, you know, I went back and looked at some of the syllabi. Uh, there was, yeah, the Chinese model was different. And, you know, our autocracy is better than democracies at, at, at growth. Uh, by the way, Catherine and I used to debate on Halloween. That, she always took the side of the autocracies. I always took the side of the democracies. She, I don't know if you still do it, she used to come dressed as a witch, uh, and she had this fantastic costume, and she won the debate every time, just so you know. Uh, and I always, causation is correlation. I always like, she's winning because she's got the better outfit, uh, not because autocracies are better. And candy, I brought candy. And she brought candy, too. You know, so who, why, why was she winning? Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in the back of my mind, there was always like, yeah, the Chinese have a different model, but they're more or less becoming like us, right? 20 years ago. Why are they growing? They're growing not because they're doubling down on Maoism. They're, they're growing because they're entering the global economy. They're introducing markets. That feels like, you know, a very contested, <laughs> that doesn't feel like it's real anymore, right? And, and is this an alternative model? or not, uh, especially just uh, over the last, you know, what's happened in, in Beijing at the Party Congress, I still want to keep open the longer term. And I'm going to end on the longer term. And Didi, cut me off whenever you want. Uh, but, but I do, I worry that, that, that things seem dire if you're just thinking about the last 10 or 15 years. I'm writing a book now that covers 200 years. Things seem a lot more optimistic. And on this modernization argument with China, I want it as a hypothesis that China has a different model that we're, we'll perform. I just don't know if we know that. And I don't know if 40 years from now, when where Xi Jinping just took the country, uh, and we'll look back on that as the late Brezhnev period, I don't know. That, I want it to be more of an open question, not a closed question. It's an entirely different system. Uh, technology, uh, uh, just two anecdotes. One of our first stars of our program, uh, for the honors program was Laura Mataz. Larry, I think she was your, were you, was she, you her, were you her advisor? I can't remember. Or was it somebody else? Maybe it was me. I forgot. Uh, it was, you, it was me. Uh, she, she, <laughs> it's been a long time. 20 years is a long time ago. Um, well, I'm, I'm still in touch with Laura. Uh, she wrote about the great technological innovations of the color revolution and why liberation technology, that's why I was thinking of Larry, was going to change the world for the good in terms of uh, technology. Uh, by the way, Laura's still working on that stuff in the US government, doing fantastic work. So um, she, I just looked it up. She runs the Open Technology Fund. Um, but that is not that, that feels a lot different now. We have a lot of seminars about how techno technology is destroying democracy. Uh, Chip already talked about the sequencing question. I would say, you know, we spent a lot of time on that, and I still don't know what the answer is, and, and maybe we won't, uh, but, but I'm struck by the, that I am not uh, talking about those sequencing questions. Uh, maybe that's just because I haven't kept up with the literature. Finally, on the long term, um, what is great about this community, and I have a lot to say about this community if I get another chance, um, is we rightfully are interdisciplinary. That was from the get-go, and that was Chip, and that was fantastic. Uh, we also have aspirations. I'm not sure we, we've accomplished it, but, but to translate research into policy and to teach people that might want to be policy makers, right? Laura's a great example. Um, what I would say about that that keeps me optimistic is two things. One. I'm writing about the long term now, and so it feels like a dark time now, but, but man, the 20s and 30s felt pretty dark, and the 60s and 70s felt pretty dark. I'm not going back as, you know, I don't start, I don't start history the way Frank does. Uh, you know, first man started walking. Uh, you know, that's, that's how he starts his books. Uh, so I'm, I am interested in your perspective on this, Frank. But, but that makes me optimistic when you take a longer term view. The second thing that makes me optimistic is I teach at Stanford. I get to interact with young people every day. They are optimistic. Uh, and, and that helps to keep me optimistic. And the third thing uh, is this training piece that, that Catherine mentioned. But it's been essential, not just to this 
this thing that they come here and we train them. It's such a weird word because because we learn from them for God's sakes. And 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 I think CDDRL would not exist without the Summer Fellows Program. I'm looking at you guys. It brought us together intellectually. We had to come up with the syllabus for that Summer Fellows Program. That was an intellectual pro I'm looking at you guys because I remember the arguments about what do we teach, what do we don't. Without the Summer Fellows Program, I don't think our program this center would exist. So the causality is a little bit different here. Uh, but the other thing, um, I, I just saw um, uh, uh, Alexei Navalny, he's a guy, he's an opposition leader. He's in Russia, his daughter goes to school here. I just saw Dasha a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and many people through our training programs have been affiliated with Alexei personally and with people like them around the world. And and if he's sitting in a jail right now, and he is, and he gets paper for 30 minutes, uh, and then they take it away from him. For, so for 23 hours and 30 minutes, he, he does not get paper. Uh, and he gets one book. He's, he's arguing to get a new book now, but he, he gets one book for months and months and months. And yet he's still optimistic about the future and fighting for the future. Uh, who am I to be pessimistic? And, and I think the fact we get to interact with those kind of people uh, is a part of what makes me intellectually curious about them, by the way, and what makes them tick, but also makes me optimistic about the long run. All right, so Larry, let's go to you. Keep it on mute. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Perfectly. Good, good. So, uh, let me uh, first express my regret uh, for not being able to join you in person, even though I'm sitting only two miles away, so it feels kind of perverse. But obviously, the only thing that could explain that is that uh, I've tested positive for COVID. Uh, and uh, that is because I recently returned from an international democracy conference in Taiwan and a speech to the uh, Stanford alumni in Taiwan, which was a really great experience. But um, in any case, that's the reality. And the fact that I'm feeling pretty good now is a great tribute to our uh, vaccines. So I, I hope everyone is um, well vaccinated, particularly since I see very few people there who are wearing masks. Um, let me begin by um, uh, uh, Echoing what Catherine said, I just feel a compulsion uh, to do this uh, because I feel very strongly about it. Um, when, uh, uh, of course, I was there uh, at the beginning uh, when Chip brought us all together and we were beginning to strategize on the future. Uh, and it was the support of the Hewlett Foundation that enabled us to lift off. But um, when that support came to an end as it needed to do at some point, we were very uncertain <laughs> as to uh, how well, let's put it that way, CDDRL could go on without that institutional support. And I won't name all the individuals again, it's not that long a list, but the ones that Catherine named uh, have been transformative uh, in enabling the work of CDDRL enabling my work and enabling the work of the individuals you see there uh, on the podium. Uh, so I, I can't express profoundly enough uh, my personal and institutional gratitude toward them. Now, uh, le let me just briefly uh, summarize four uh, changes that I think have happened in the world, um, which have already uh, largely been referred to, not entirely. Uh, that I think need to be noted in terms of thinking about how the world is different now than it was uh, when CDDRL lifted off uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the most obvious thing that could be said is that we're in a democratic recession now. Uh, and as, uh, as has already been noted, um, that is a profoundly different um, uh, trajectory than the very hopeful and expansive one uh, that we were still in, in the post-Cold War world uh, that CDDRL uh, entered uh, in 2002. And um, it, it's kind of hard to know quite how to assess this moment, because on the one hand, um, 
it's it's a deeply uh, negative period, frankly. There are almost no transitions to democracy happening. Um, there is very significant erosion of democracy, even in the democracies uh, that uh, the big and important democracies that still survive as democracies. Um, Shumit, who I see in the front row there, Shumit Ganguly and I and Dinsha Mystery, have uh, just finished editing a book on the troubled state of India's democracy. Uh, I think 20 years or so after Shumit and I uh, uh, edited a similar book about uh, India. And, um, you know, uh, in India has continued to make some very important uh, achievements developmentally but it has been uh, sliding backwards in the quality of democracy. Brazil um, has had, I, I think, and we still aren't out of the woods in Brazil. I think the reason why it took Jair Bolsonaro two days uh, to not even acknowledge, he still hasn't to my knowledge, his election defeat, but to state that he uh, would leave office and turn over the presidency to um, Lula da Silva, who narrowly defeated him in the presidential election, is that he was probably canvassing the opinions of the military as to whether they would support him in staging a coup to stay in power. That is my speculation. I can't prove it, but it would be consistent with the way that he has been behaving. Uh, Mexico, you see a personalistic concentration of power uh, that's been ongoing under President Lopez Obrador, who would probably uh, eliminate term limits if he could get away with it. And in country after country uh, where democracy is still surviving, uh, we see these worrisome trends. And then there are uh, quite a number of countries, I would include the Philippines here, uh, Hungary, obviously Turkey, more recently El Salvador, and many others um, where uh, democracy has failed, not in the old fashioned way of uh, a military coup or an executive declaration uh, suspending democracy, though that has essentially happened in Tunisia, the only Arab democracy, uh, but with the gradual suffocation of democracy but by what I called in my book, Ill Wins, the Autocrats 12-step program. And this just keeps going on. And while there have been modest um, movement in a different direction, the election of a more democratic leader in Zambia and so on, the deterioration is continuing. I'm very worried about South Africa uh, and almost no one uh, these days is paying much attention to the African continent. And I don't see much attention being paid by the Biden administration, but uh, South Africa is in a very deep crisis of governance and public confidence in the democracy. There is a popular extreme left-wing uh, uh, populist uh, uh, leader waiting in the wings uh, who could uh, carry things in a much more um, uh, authoritarian direction. Uh, I think uh, that we are looking at the possibility of a partial state collapse of authority uh, in Nigeria, the largest country in Africa, which is slated to surpass the United States in this, in this century is the third most populous country. A uh, very dear friend of mine in the academic community was just kidnapped a few days ago. Uh, crime and terrorism are surging out of control. Uh, and I could go on and on. So um, we are in difficulty. And yet, uh, even though uh, we've slipped below the kind of majority threshold in terms of the percentage of states above one million people that are still democracies, by my assessment, um, you know, we still have nearly half of the of the larger states of the world, over one million people that are meet the test of electoral democracy. And, um, uh, you know, a majority of the world states altogether, if you count the smaller ones. Now, um, this raises the question of why this is happening. And 
that's my second point. What we're seeing uh, in the last really decade uh, since uh, Orban surged back to power in Hungary is um, a great proliferation of populism and political polarization all around the world and a utilization by illiberal uh, and authoritarian minded or more explicitly authoritarian politicians of um, populism and divisive messages as a deliberate strategy to polarize the society. Populism and polarization go together uh, and they become a formula for democratic uh, destruction. And I have to say, um, very sadly, Mike has already made reference to this, that the evolution of uh, digital technology, I think, has had a lot to do with this. I think that one of the reasons why we are in a global democratic recession is that we are in a global proliferation uh, and profusion of social media platforms and tools that have as their business model um, the elevation of um, divisive, emotion-generating, uh, hate-generating, and polarizing content. And uh, until we can figure out a way of reining that in or turning it in a better direction, and it looks like Twitter is about to be turned, for example, in a much worse direction, uh, I think it's going to be difficult to reverse this. Uh, so uh, we have one of the important things that has happened at FSI since the creation of CDDRL has been the more recent establishment and drawing together of many individuals, Frank and I are involved in it, of the Cyber Policy Center. Uh, but we really have not turned the corner on developing a strategy to counter effectively and comprehensively, or at least reduce the energy and virality of disinformation uh, and its polarizing implications. This leads me to the third change, um, which I think is the most disturbing of all of them, uh, and which has um, been intimately related to the trends of uh, social media divisiveness and political polarization, which is the alarming decay of democracy and democratic norms and values in the United States. I can tell you, we never imagined, I should speak for myself, but uh, Chip and Mike, uh, you can testify to this because you were there at the beginning. I don't re recall a single conversation in 2000, 2001, 2002, or in the years after as we were getting going that imagined that democracy itself uh, could be at risk in the most powerful and important democracy in the world, which is the United States. And I think that we need to acknowledge, uh, not with depression, but uh, with sobriety and hopefully renewed resolve, that American democracy is now at grave and existential risk. Uh, we have had attendant with the rise of um, political polarization, disinformation, and the divisiveness and, and hate and violence that has been inspired by social media in the United States, uh, very deep and proliferating challenges to the legitimacy of elect elections and the most fundamental norm of any democracy, which is the willingness to respect electoral outcomes, uh, observe minimum rules of um, restraint uh, and um, uh, rule of law abidance in the context of electoral um, uh, competition, and leave office if you're defeated. And we now have 60% uh, of the American population living in states where election deniers, many of whom are sending pretty serious signals that they'll do whatever is necessary in order to prevail, 
uh, challenging that norm. We have a candidate uh, for governor of, you know, an important swing state, Wisconsin, who has vowed that um, he will, uh, if he wins, uh, his party will never leave power in the state of Wisconsin. That is not <laughs> what democratic norms are all about. And I am very worried uh, that we are uh, on a trajectory that could lead within the next few years to something much worse than January 6th, really a, um, an actual breakdown of American democracy. And let me just briefly mention the fourth big change in the world that I think we could have seen coming uh, in 2000, 2001, 2002, but didn't anticipate, or most of us, I think, didn't anticipate taking quite the form that it has. And that is uh, not only the rise of China as the second really major power in the world, uh, but the rise of China as a neo-totalitarian power under Xi Jinping that is projecting uh, sharp power in the world in a way that is really directly and very seriously threatening the quality and stability and maybe survival of, of democracy in many countries around the world. We are alarmed now about the challenge that uh, and crisis that Russia, Russia has generated with uh, its invasion uh, of Ukraine, which I think represents an existential challenge uh, to democracy, not only in Ukraine and by extension uh, post-communist space, but really globally for the example it, it may set. But Taiwan uh, may only be a, a few years away from facing the same challenge. I've just finished my second trip to Taiwan in three months, and they are beginning to grasp the profundity and urgency of the challenge they face. Uh, but neither Taiwan nor the United States nor Japan, which will be crucial for the defense of Taiwan if it should come to that, are frankly prepared for, for what might happen uh, by the judgment of our own colleague at the Freeman Spogli Institute, Oriana Mastro, who believes that we could be within a five-year window of you know, not just escalating Chinese military pressure on Taiwan, which is happening on an almost daily basis now, but literally a Chinese amphibious invasion uh, of the island of Taiwan. So um, on the one hand, uh, democracy is still functioning and in some places thriving uh, in about half of the states of the world. On the other hand, I think we are drifting to a kind of 1930s um, reality in the world where you know, the most basic parameters of the future of freedom in the world are at stake. All right, Frank, and then Catherine. Frank, okay. Um, well, it's very hard to follow Larry yeah. Diamond. I think that <laughs> I think that you'll agree that he he, he looms he looms yeah. as a yeah. larger than life yeah. figure. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I cannot tell you what uh, uh, C D Darrell was like uh, at the beginning because I'm the only one on the panel that wasn't here then. Uh, I was at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International uh, Studies, and I did not arrive at CDDRL until 2010. Uh, but you know, it's worth reflecting a little bit about uh, what I was thinking back then, and it was, um, you know, as people have said, very, very different. Uh, I think that it's in many ways related to geopolitics because there was this 20-year period from the fall of the Berlin Wall, I think, really up through the financial crisis, the subprime crisis in 2008, when the world was very unbalanced. Uh, and it was a period of American hegemony. Uh, this was a period when the American defense budget was larger than all of the other defense budgets for all of the other countries in the world added together. Uh, but it was also you know, economic, it was cultural, it was political. Uh, and so you know, it's a very unusual period in global history that 
so much power was concentrated in the hands of one uh, country. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm afraid that the United States actually did not make the best use of that power in that uh, period when uh, it existed. Uh, at that point, we thought that there was actually going to be a world shaped by liberal values, uh, and the big problems were going to be, you know, failed states that, you know, like Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Liberia, uh, Bosnia, that basically needed the help of a united international community. Uh, you may remember this concept of the responsibility to protect. People were debating whether we had a positive duty to actually intervene militarily to keep these places uh, going. And, you know, in a way, uh, it led to a sort of hubris. You know, Stalin would have said we were a little bit dizzy with success. And I think there were two manifestations of that in that first decade of the 21st century. The first was the Iraq War, uh, where there was an administration that believed that you could actually democratize a very culturally different part of the world uh, through the use of military force. Uh, and then the second was, frankly, the subprime crisis itself, in which this uh, very open, uh, I would say, neoliberal model that uh, we had been following uh, collapsed on itself. And I think both of those uh, did a great deal to undermine the credibility, certainly the Iraq War undermine the credibility of American democracy promotion. I don't know how many meetings I've been in outside of the United States where somebody kind of assumes, oh, you're in favor of democracy promotion. Please don't invade my country, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, that was, that was an argument that was made in this, uh, this period of American uh, dominance. By the way, I, I, I'm not in the camp of people that want to blame America first. One of the one of the really weird things about the world right now is that this used to be the province of the far left in this country, that America was the source of all evil. It's now drifted over to the far right. Uh, I don't quite understand why that's happened. I'm not in that camp because I think America has actually done a lot of good things in the world and the balance sheet is different, but there's no question that uh, it may not be the best thing in the world for one country to believe that it, you know, it, it, uh, uh, had that much power to reshape global uh, politics. But that period came to an end uh, with the results, you know, uh, I think that other speakers here have talked about. However, uh, I, 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 Larry just left me way too depressed. Uh, <laughs> I have some happier news. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, and I want to, uh, you know, say a couple of things, uh, maybe to cheer you up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because I do think that, you know, some of the reasons that we believe in democracy and liberal democracy uh, are still operative despite the democratic recession, despite all of the setbacks. Uh, you know, there are actually quite a few countries in Europe that are doing quite well. I've spent a lot of time in Europe in the last uh, two months. Uh, and, you know, many democracies there ex uh, have a great deal of social consensus. They're institutions are working well, they're not polarized, uh, they can reflect democratic will, you know, quite uh, effectively. Um, and I think that we have to remember that there are really grave defects uh, with authoritarian countries. So Russia and China have both been arguing in the last few years that the West is in terminal decline, that the liberal democratic model is bankrupt, that you need strong centralized government of the sort that they have if you're going to make decisions uh, quickly and decisively uh, and actually get things done. Well, they've been getting things done in recent years, but uh, not so successfully. Uh, and I think that it is directly related to the authoritarian model that they represent. And there are really two problems with this model. The first is in decision making that if you have a system where one person at the top makes all the decisions, you're gonna get bad decisions uh, uh, over time. Not maybe immediately, but you're gonna get bad decisions. Second is that uh, these systems are very brittle. Uh, they maintain the show of great social consensus, and they do that up until the time that they fall apart. And then all of a sudden people say, oh, well, look, I mean, I guess there wasn't so much legitimacy in this system after all. And I think those are uh, present in Russia, China, and 
uh, Iran, other, you know, Venezuela, other authoritarian states as we speak. Uh, if you remember President Putin sitting at the end of this 30 foot long table with his defense minister, he was so scared of COVID that, you know, he didn't want to actually come close to even his uh, National Security Council and evidently made this decision all by himself to invade uh, Ukraine. He didn't know anything of what was going on in Ukraine. He didn't know what was happening in his own military. And as a result, he made, I think, one of the biggest strategic blunders of any uh, great power leader in my lifetime. Uh, one that is going to hurt his country uh, and hurt his legacy uh, in the world, uh, you know, I think, uh, henceforth. Uh, and that's something that can only be done in that kind of an autocratic system. Uh, I think that something similar is going on in China, where you had a pretty well institutionalized authoritarian system with term limits, mandatory retirement, a recruitment system that was actually very meritocratic uh, and effective in many ways. And that has been progressively dismantled by Xi Jinping, symbolized by his elimination of the 10 year term limit at the 20th uh, party Congress and you know the manifestation of that a bad decision making was you know the zero COVID policy which really is shaving a couple points off you know GDP growth in China uh, and that is combined with a economic model that I think is imploding in many ways this vast overinvestment in housing that uh, is now coming home to roost Iran I think demonstrates you know that fragility in, in regimes. I mean, the women of Iran, as we speak for now, what is it, four or five weeks have been rising up virtually every Iranian city because they cannot stand being ruled by these old guys that, that think that they have to determine the way they dress and act and, uh, and so forth. So uh, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm particularly worried as Larry is about the United States, but I do think that we have to bear in mind as we think about the future 20, years of CDDRL that we really do hold some important ace cards being liberal democracies that uh, our opponents are not, uh, you know, 10 feet, they don't loom over us like some people, uh, <laughs> or they shouldn't seem to loom over us. Um, and, uh, you know, we should hold our heads up, you know, as, uh, as liberal Democrats <laughs> and proceed on that basis. All right, so I, I know that clock is a little behind schedule and I know Chip has a date with some alumni uh, online in a little bit. So I, I will try not to talk too long, but um, you asked us, you know, what's different. So let me just take you back in time to 2002. And, and, um, and since I'm a Russia specialist, um, I'm, I would, I'm just gonna quibble with you and say, it's not Russia arguing uh, that autocracy is better. It's Vladimir Putin arguing that, um, but uh, unfortunately there's some people who follow him there. Um, so obviously, I'm going to focus on a huge change in relations with Russia between 2002 and now. So in 2002, Putin uh, was two years into his first uh, term as president, um, and I looked at some pictures and wow, he looks really different, um, as do we all except for Chip, actually. Um, <laughs> but he was still open to uh, the West in a, in a way that he is not 20 years later. So. I don't think any of us in 2002 would have predicted that he would uh, invade Ukraine in 2022. Um, well, why not? And well, one reason is he's purportedly one of the first, if not the first foreign leader to call George W. Bush after 9-11 and express his condolences and offer his help in this global war on uh, terror, which he himself was facing, uh, he felt in Russia. Um, 2002 was also the first year of Russian cooperation with NATO through the establishment of the Russian NATO Council, uh, and on the agenda was combating global terrorism. We also saw in 2002 the largest expansion in history um, of NATO with former communist countries joining Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovenia, and Slovakia. And it looked like a triumph of liberal internationalism. Many of them soon joined the European Union, which was a very successful project in uh, democratic transition. Amakai, and Mike and I and others worked on a book on that, as was mentioned. Um, we also had a very good dialogue uh, going with Russia at the time in, in 2002. George W. Bush um, visited Moscow on a state visit. 
Um, and um, that was only a year after, in June 2001, when he said the infamous words that I have written down here and declared in his meeting with Vladimir Putin, June 2001. So just as, as CDDRL was germinating, I guess, I looked the man in the eye and I found him to be very straightforward and trustworthy. We had a very good dialogue. I was able to get a sense of his soul, a man deeply committed to his country and the best interests of his country. So he had a rather different appraisal of Vladimir Putin than I think most of us would have today in 2022. In contrast to that time, here we are, uh, June 2022, current President Joe Biden, along with his wife Jill and daughter Ashley, were put on the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs stop list so they cannot enter Russia. And I must say, Frank, Larry, and myself were also added at that time on the same list. Mike was already on it. I'm pretty sure Chip is too. Um, so relations with Russia, obviously very different. In 2002 also, George Bush gave uh, his Axis of Evil speech, uh, and the Axis of Evil was Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, Iran and North Korea still on that Axis of Evil. Uh, Iraq, not exactly a complete failure, and here I'll just say a few positive things. Um, after the Afghan war, I'll just pause is, before I say positive things. Um, is uh, looked as though we had won it easily, uh, but we lost the peace, of course. And so, so uh, you know, Eric and, and several others, Alex Thier, were working on uh, the constitution in Afghanistan, on rule of law in Afghanistan over the years. And unfortunately, that's, you know, a failure, I guess. Um, Iraq, you could argue, is less of a failure. I actually happened to look up some numbers on development because uh, I honor and praise our economists uh, at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and it pains me that none of you are sitting here. Um, but we're political scientists, so we know more about strategy, maybe? I don't, I'm not sure. Or leadership? I don't know. I don't know what to take from that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, um, in the good news department, Iraq was a, a, a low-income to lower-income country before the invasion. Now, I'm not going to justify it or make any normative comment on that. However, um, it is now uh, not that, it, it is, it is a, a middle-income country. Um, you know, in 2002, we were consumed with AIDS and how it was decimating the sub-Saharan um, uh, continent. 40 million people were affected worldwide with AIDS and HIV, big steps forward, and, and therefore big steps forward in global development. And, and I don't want to minimize enduring problems, but and there are still problems in sub-Saharan Africa, but I would encourage you to go to this very cool map the World Bank has um, where you can you know, go back and look at 2002 versus 2022 um, and see things like uh, changes in GDP per capita. Um, as I said, 2002, Iraq, a lower middle income country, that's just before the invasion. Uh, it's now an upper middle income country, so not a complete failure. Um, um, Frank mentioned in Europe, some democracies are doing okay, some are doing more than okay. We've tended to focus on uh, the problems, and I think Viktor Orban in Hungary gets, frankly, a lot more attention than he's, he's really warranted, uh, and we pick on him, but not on the successes. So, as I said, the EU, very successful model of uh, getting uh, economic transition and political transition accomplished uh, quickly by building institutions, which is a lot of the work that we do at, at CDDRL is encouraging in, a stronger institutions. By the way, how many of you know that Denmark just elected a very moderate center-right, center-left coalition government? this past you know, couple of days. Uh, OK, so Denmark, friend of the center. Um, <laughs> it's, it's where Frank wants to be. It's, uh, and the rest of us, too. We are all trying to get to Denmark. That's the ideal um, of, of development. But 2002, significant also. Euro, the euro becomes the official currency of the EU. Um, and uh, former communist countries like, uh, the, uh, like Poland, the three Baltic republics, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia, all are now classified as high income economies. They were all low income economies before. Um, now uh, they're among the high income economies uh, of Europe. So again, concerns about, um, about Hungary and democratic backsliding and, and Larry is alone in his house with a really bad cold and COVID. So, you know, buck up my friend. Um, I also think the war in Ukraine is awful as it is for Ukrainians may or may have slowed democratic recession in, in Poland. 
Um, and perhaps we'll also in, in Hungary when they see what the alternative is and, and what it looks like. Um, I could just spend a second in South America because we haven't touched on that. Um, in 2002, Brazil was a lower middle income country. Today, it's an upper middle income country. And Bolsonaro is not, he, he, you know, He's not not acknowledging that, uh, it, that there is a new president, let me put it that way, and he has has put in place uh, plans for the transition to take place. Um, so we can look through um, uh, other places that haven't uh, improved, um, but some of the work that um, that Beatrice and Alberto have done and, and Marcel Fafchamp here at, uh, on, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa on policy changes and targeted subsidy programs clearly have lifted millions of people out of terrible, terrible Poverty. So I don't, I don't want to focus only on some of the democratic recession and the problems here in the United States, but also focus on, you know, some of the solutions. Um, um, a lot more of the world is is uh, doing better. That was low income in the past, um, and um, I don't want to overstate it, as I said, but there has been important change. And at the same time, commensurately, many of these people have uh, places have seen uh, positive political um, developments toward democracy. So sometimes we focus only on the disasters. That's where the stories are. Um, um, but there are some successes uh, as well. Chip is so disgusted he's leaving now. So. It's not the CDDRL I found. <laughs> Unfortunately, we I'm so sorry, Chip, um, that he has to leave. I'm sorry for the audience that we don't get to hear more of him. For those of you staying for a dinner, we will hopefully be able to, to get more of Chip's thoughts. But in the interest of time, and also because we've covered a lot already, including about how CDDRL does its work at the intersection of policy and scholarship, um, including through its programs of teaching, of education, research, and leadership, I'm going to skip ahead. So thinking ahead to the next 20 years, You've already laid out, all of you, what the challenges you see are for the future of democracy and development globally. How do you think CDDRL, given its many different tracks of, of change, I suppose, the ways that it approaches global change um, and its mission, how can CDDRL best address those challenges? And we'll go in reverse order this time. Catherine. Um. Well, I think we've talked about some of the challenges. I'm sort of interested in hearing questions and comments from the audience as well, because there's so many uh, smart alumni in, uh, of the center in the, in the group. But I think, you know, working through, as Michael said, the puzzle of, of the attraction of autocracy, um, I think Putin is going to help us with that. Um, and she too, as Frank mentioned, right? These are uh, guys making bad decisions. Um, and exploding really the myth of authoritarian competence. Uh, you know, Mike and I wrote a piece, was that in 2009, eight, eight. remember? Um, on seven, sort of the myth of the authoritarian model and, and how Putin was, was you know, leading Russia um, not so well. And uh, well, here we are. Um, and I think we will see that, you know, we can see actually not in approval ratings of Putin, but we can see in um, mood, the mood, if you look at feelings um, surveys uh, in, in Russia, the mood's not good. Half of Russians are saying, you know, the world is terrible and, and, and I feel bad. And, um, and so that, you know, that tells you something that's not preference fal falsification, but I think sort of studying these shifts, as Mike said as well, uh, I think we also have to shift some of our interests back to the what what Tim Snyder called the bloodlands, right, of Eastern and, and Central Europe, and and um, how they are sustaining democracy and um, development. And Anna Jismalabuse and I have had this program on rethinking European development as well because of it. Um, so I will. I think also, obviously, the resilience of the of the U.S. Um, democratic system. Um, we have to keep working on and more of the work that you do, Dee. So I'll stop there. All right, Frank. Well, my prescription for the next uh, twenty years uh, is something that will be really familiar to those of you that have been listening to me for the previous few years. <laughs> I, I just think that we have to uh, concentrate on actually uh, how democracies actually deliver the goods. Uh, you know, most people in the democracy field want to go to authoritarian governments and say, stop, you know, don't torture people, don't uh, violate their rights, uh, uh, have good elections and so forth. But then when they get into power, they have no idea how to actually govern uh, uh, democratically and exercise 
power in an effective way and deliver the things that people want out of government. And there's just been repeated failures. I mean, Tunisia is just the latest one where no economic growth, you know, really for the whole period that this democratic government's been in power. Uh, that was the problem in the Orange Revolution, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and it extends to this country where we can't build a damn thing because our procedural approach to, to you know, things like infrastructure is way too complex and, and constraining. So I would say that a focus on actually democracies delivering uh, is something we need to spend more time, you know, uh, thinking about and, and, and fixing. All right, Larry. Well, um, let me begin, begin by saying that I uh, do agree with a very important point that Frank made about the intrinsic vulnerability of authoritarian regimes. And I think one of the most striking changes of the last couple of years is the really unraveling of China's uh, developmental success story in, in the face of COVID and Xi Jinping's blindness to the requirements for uh, effective governance. You know, uh, people were predicting, uh, Fareed Zakaria talked about this on a show last weekend, that China would surpass the United States in the size of its economy by the end of this decade. And as a result of economic growth shrinking, you know, by some estimates to two and a half percent a year, but by others to virtually nothing, uh, economists are now um, suggesting that it might be decades or never that China will surpass the U.S. in economic growth. And I think we're seeing two simultaneous trajectories. One, China becoming um, less effective in a lot of ways under Xi Jinping, and two, China becoming more dangerous under Xi Jinping. So for CDDRL, let me say uh, a few obvious things. Um, uh, the greatest impact um, that we have had uh, in, in kind of near term is through our training programs. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak about our teaching in a minute, but um, Frank couldn't um, applaud his own Leadership Academy for Development. So I'll uh, join Catherine in doing so. I, th I think it's just been an astonishing success story and it's a proven model. And one of the things uh, that Frank and his colleagues in the program have done that I think has been an important element uh, of, of training that we've carried into the Draper Hill Summer Fellows Program and which our fellows love is the case study method of getting them to grapple with real world policy challenges and the often painful and um, not so obvious trade-offs uh, that uh, policymakers and civic groups need to wrestle with uh, in confronting these real world challenges. So I think one of the directions or opportunities uh, I think for CDDRL is to figure out not only how to uh, sustain uh, these training programs uh, for the um, in-country leadership academy for development, for the in Stanford Draper Hill Summer Fellows Program, for the Ukraine program, which we haven't mentioned, but Catherine has uh, guided us, uh, I guess, an in interaction with Mike to, I think, a very exciting and uh, innovative new iteration that we're going to be um, unfolding. Uh, I, I think deepening and sustaining these is a very important development. Secondly, um, our, um, our teaching, I, I'm not going to trumpet our research, we're going to continue to do that. And we've spoken about some of the directions that it might take. But um, Mike has already um, implied the way in which over 20 years, our teaching and training of Stanford students is now accumulating into the production of a cadre, if I can use that term rather ironically, of, or cohort might be a better term, or um, community, an even better term, of um, <laughs> policy-minded individuals, many of them in government, spread across different uh, agencies and departments of government. Others in the private sector are moving back and forth uh, between uh, 
um, technology companies, uh, finance companies, development agencies, Millennium Challenge Corporation, USAID, and so on, um, who share a common sense of the intimate interactions between democracy, development, and the rule of law, uh, and kind of the place that we're trying to get to. Maybe it'll never get to Denmark, uh, as uh, Frank keeps um, uh, guiding us to do, but at least trying to get close in terms of the quality of governance. And as Frank keeps emphasizing, the essential role of the quality of the state uh, and of state capacity um, in trying to uh, bring us there. And I think uh, in that regard, uh, we not only need to sustain our CDDRL uh, honors program, uh, and of course we have such deep gratitude um, to Sako and her family for the gift that has enabled us to put that on permanent footing. And I see at least one or two of our alumni from that program in the audience. Um, but you know, hopefully we can expand it in various ways. I'll just make one more point. Um, COVID has hit very hard um, our mission as well as the general educational mission of Stanford in a variety of ways, subtle and not so subtle. Um, we urgently need to get back um, the placement of our Stanford students, undergraduate as well as graduate in international uh, internships abroad where they can help make a difference to a variety of you know, government and official efforts, but also non-governmental efforts, but also it be can become a formative um, experience for them uh, in, in the growth of their careers. And related to that, I think, is the forging of relationships with individual uh, critical countries. Um, we've spoken about Ukraine, not enough, but we have. I think there are real opportunities uh, in Taiwan now, uh, which I was exploring. It was the reason, a, an important reason why I went there and spoke to the Stanford alumni there. Uh, but finally, I want to mention India, which I think will be absolutely vital um, to the future of um, uh, development and democracy in the world, to the future of the world economy. India is pretty soon if it is not already going to be uh, the most populous country in the world, and I think in the years to come, the most important source of global economic uh, dynamism and growing market share. Uh, but in addition, of course, um, uh, is the importance of Indian democracy to the future of um, global democracy. So the opportunity for Stanford, so long delayed, I think, to establish um, uh, uh, a focused program of engagement in and study of uh, India, I think is a major priority for FSI and uh, in some way perhaps for CDDRL uh, in the next uh, years, not just to mention decades. All right, Mike, and we only have about 10 more minutes. So if you could you know, be somewhat just succinct in what you think CDDRL can do for the next 20 years, and maybe we can take a question or two. Get it, get it out there, Mike, really. Yeah, 20 so, years of support. I'll be very brief. So I'll do one macro, one micro. The macro piece, um, if it's all about geopolitics again, as Frank said, and I'm thinking about when Kagan came here and, and spoke about power and relationship and the jungles growing back, then the number one thing uh, the world needs to do, and I would say the world, because this should not be an American conversation, is to renew democracy in the most powerful countries. So uh, that's the, you know, we're, we're skating around it, but that to me is central. Everything else doesn't matter if our democracy breaks down, you know, whatever your training program for, for country X, Y, and Z won't matter. That's a policy statement. That's not a, that's not a research statement. But what we can do, and I, we're doing it, and I see you know, our cyber policy friends are here. I see Nate. There's lots of people here doing that. What are the things that can help renew democracy? How do we learn from a comparative perspective, historical? Um, I think that's essential. By the way, it is not true. I don't know which one of our panelists said it, that we were not thinking of the breakdown of democracy. Gerhardt, if I'm not mistaken, you gave a speech nearly 20 years ago about Caesarism, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you warned about, you were speaking about the United States of America 
And if I'm not mistaken, and if I'm if I'm assigning this uh, idea to Gerhardt, and it was really yours, Catherine, I apologize. But um, uh, you know, depends if it was good or not. Well, it was a really good, <laughs> and, and maybe it was Steve Sevens. I can't remember because I'm old. But um, and I'm gonna get to that. That's a really important thing. That's what I'm gonna end with. But democ American democracy and comparative perspective. Actually, we did do that a lot longer than a lot of our colleagues are doing it, and we need to do more of it. This notion that we have American politics here and comparative politics here. That's that hard. Department of Political <laughs> Science. That's the, the the way the discipline of political science. That was you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and we yes. we were ahead of the curve. On on that and we got to we got to build even more on that but the second thing i want to say is we just talked about you know 20 years where we're here in 20 years all this breakdown stuff um, and i think the central challenge for cddrl is to avoid cddrl institutional breakdown uh, we've had a fantastic run for 20 years and and i wanted to talk more about that we this because you guys are all so academic. Um, and we had to talk about all these really heavy things and I knew Larry was gonna do that. And by the way, he doesn't talk that way just when he's sitting in his I home. Know, he I talks know. that way all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's why we love Larry Diamond. But, 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 but I, I mean this sincerely, these training programs we've all talked about, that, you know, we nurtured them from nothing and, and they're fantastic. The, the, the Summer Fellows Program, CDDRL Honors Program. We stole that from CSAC, the idea. We didn't steal We it, stole Mike. the idea. I was we there. Improved on it. Uh, and we, we improved it. Fantastic yeah. program. My son is an alum. Wow. That's how so fantastic it is. The Jack courses we do, awesome. the course Catherine is teaching now. But, and the people, like, like look at this room. Look at all the people that this, this really, really unique ecosystem that I, Didi, you told me I don't have time, so I'm not going to get into well, the details, you know, but, but it is unique. There are not many places like CDDRL on the planet. Uh, there's nowhere like it at Stanford University, and it is also fragile, in my view. These are not things that are easily, uh, that, you know, 20 years, we're just going to have a run. Larry, you said we're going to continue our research. And I wanted to say, how long are we going to continue our research, Larry Diamond and Mike McFall and Frank Fukuyama, which is to say we've got I'm to figure much, out much a way <laughs> to be to continue to nurture this thing, because the, the main thing that I care passionately about is the people that we created with this community. It's the, the other stuff, but the students, the, the people we've trained or they've trained us, we've got to figure out a way to, to have a 20 year trajectory for that. And, that's why I'm glad it's in Catherine's hands now, but we've got to do that collectively because the, the idea that we're just going to do this and it's all going to be, I, I actually, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about uh, trends in academia. I'm worried about trends at the university here that we're at where uh, that we need to do more to get students interested in the topics uh, we're, we're talking about. Uh, those are things I think are, are challenging. Uh, and we need to keep wrestling with them and not just assume that we're going to be here in 20 years. I don't know. I think that's a, we just heard about all the democracies 20 years ago that we were uh, excited about. We've got to be very strategic to keep this incredibly precious thing that we have, have developed so that it'll be around for 20 years. All right. Very good. Apologies for how close we are to time. I think we can take one question at least from the audience. <laughs> one, we started and five minutes late, I'm, so if we went to 6.05, yeah, we would it we be can bad? Yeah, a few minutes over, but... No. no. All right, Larry, two seconds. Or was that an oh, accident? No. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I'm now in the role of the optimist, because I'm not worried about the future of CDDRL. Um, uh, I think we do need to, uh, in the coming years, renew our, our ranks. Um, you've got a long uh, runway, uh, Mike. Um, a couple of us maybe are a little bit further along. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's not uh, there's, super dark. there's tremendous talent out there. There's tremendous talent in this room. I'm very confident that we're going to raise the resources to not only be able to continue at the pace we're going, but to expand it. And to answer the question you pose, I plan to continue doing this research until I'm either uh, dead or mentally incompetant. Which I realize <laughs> okay. Close it right there and everyone dying. Okay? Yeah. Like, does anybody have a question? If so, please approach the mic. Quick. All Something right. right here. Yes. Just walk up to the microphone if you wouldn't mind. 
We have 125 students in our undergrad class right now. So. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Julian, and I'm a sophomore at Palo Alto High School. Um, first of all, I want to thank CDRL for hosting this talk and making it open to the public. It's a great resource for all of us to learn. Um, I just want to ask Professor Diamond about, you mentioned about the decay of democracy in South Africa. I recently read that there's been a 30% decrease in arrests and a 60% decrease in conviction since 2008. And you mentioned the lack of action the Biden administration has taken in regards to improving democracy in South Africa. What do you think the Biden administration can better do to support the South African government to prevent the decay of democracy? Well, um, while you're thinking, Larry, just to advertise, uh, keep that question. One of the great things we do here at FSI and CDDRL is we bring uh, visiting scholars from around the world. And in, the, in March, I think, uh, yep. Kumi Naidu will be coming from South Africa. He's a, a world-renowned activist who thinks about these things. So you need to come find him when he's back here. He'll be in Larry's going to have a great answer, but, but Kumi yep. will have another answer as well. Thank you. Run straight um, I don't have a great answer, but I think it is an answer that will echo on whatever Kumi has to say about his own country, which is that, um, uh, like Tunisia, South Africa has not been producing anything like the economic development that the country needs and respects. Unemployment is incredibly high, and there's a whole generation of young South Africans who don't see a lot of hope or economic opportunity. and. While initially the glow of exiting apartheid uh, sustained uh, a high level of support for the regime, we now have a generation uh, rising up that has no living memory of apartheid and only has a memory of the current circumstances of lack of economic opportunity. So working with the government to do two critical things, to fight corruption, and to uh, unleash a strategy for attracting um, foreign investment and catalyzing uh, economic growth, I think are the overwhelming uh, priorities there. Great, any other questions? Thank you. Sean. Yeah, please use the Thank you very much. Uh, I've, thank you to all this panel. I've never thought as deeply about these issues as really you've, the thinking you've spurred and I've never laughed as much. <laughs> so uh, my question is to any one of you, uh, given that these crises and the advent of populism uh, in a sense has been, has been spurred by both the 2008 financial crisis and the misuse of uh, hegemon or misuse of global uh, power of the United States in Iraq, it could be elsewhere. Why haven't we seen more uh, left-sided populism rather than right-sided populism, since these are associated in the minds of people, of those that are left behind as the culprits. And, and how would that be if, 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 if these things were to be emerged? How different would they be? I vote Frank takes it. <laughs> well, um, that's a good question, because if economic inequality were the main driver of populism, then yes, you would expect people to be voting for left-wing Part, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders rather than Donald Trump. Uh, but I think that a lot of the economic inequality has been interpreted in cultural terms, you know, in terms of us being displaced by foreigners, by, you know, strange, you know, ideas coming in from abroad. And, you know, you have a lot of very clever demagogues that have been able to play on that, people's insecurities that may have started out economically, but are, you know, then, uh, seen as, as uh, attacks on their identity. And I think that that's really why, uh, you know, the, the right wing stuff is more powerful right now than the left wing stuff. And, and just could I add a caveat Please. about I just think we're in such uncertain times, right, that we need to be careful that we don't look at one vote, one demagogue and, and say this is a long term trajectory. I don't know. I mean, so remember, we had that in our country. And you know what happened four years later? The president, the guy who ran, and I know I used to work with him. He wasn't the most charismatic uh, candidate in the world. 
I don't think. Uh, uh, he ran on more economic issues, and he defeated Donald Trump and got one more votes than my old boss. By the way, that drives him crazy, Barack Obama. Uh, you know, so 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 there's something going on there, and just look what happened in Brazil. Yeah. Bolsonaro was part of a paper of populists all over the world, and he lost in one term. Yeah. So I I just think we just don't know. I, I just, anytime I hear people talk in 30 or 40 year trends, I get really nervous. I mean, you just heard the, the you know, the, what Larry said about the Chinese economy just 10 years ago, everybody said they were going to overtake us and it was just this year or that year. Now we've had to revisit those. And I just think we need to remember, I don't think we know the long term trajectories as well as we think we do. Larry or Catherine? I would just emphatically ag agree. With that and i think also there is this as i said earlier explosion uh, of the myth of of autocratic and populist competence right um i see amy saying over so all right larry yeah. then final word oh well whoa we're at 605 want, yeah, it looks larry, like it's not ahead? six but the clock's wrong actually clock's wrong. um yeah well um i think that uh the future of democracy is going to be determined in the crucibles in the near term uh, of um, three places. This is my view. Uh, and those places are Ukraine, Taiwan, and the United States. Uh, and um, I don't need to be as deeply involved with Ukraine because uh, the three individuals um, who are left among our former directors have been as eloquent and um, visionary and impactful as I think any academics in, in the world outside Ukraine in, uh, in trying to rally the necessary uh, support and resolve for that. Uh, but I'm spending a lot of time on the other two because um, I, I don't think people are, uh, what uh, Mike said, uh, notwithstanding, uh, adequately alert to the imminence of, of the dangers we confront. And that doesn't counsel pessimism. I'm not, people know me, I'm not a pessimist, um, but um, uh, maybe I should close um, by quoting Winston Churchill as I'd love to do. You can always count on the United States to do the right thing after it has exhausted all the other alternatives. Yes. <laughs> on that note, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our wonderful former directors, our current director. Thank you. Thank you.